Uh, goedemiddag iedereen en uh, hartelijk welkom. Um, we gaan deze bijeenkomst in het Engels houden uh, vanwege de taal van onze twee geëerde gasten, Sir Hustvedt en Paul Oster. Um, I especially would like to welcome both of you. Uh, Crossing Border feels very honored to have you both on the same sofa, a thing that <laughs> does not um, happen very often. Well, at least not in public, because in uh, private life, uh, I imagine you sit on the same sofa almost every night. Um, uh, we will be talking in, the, um, hour, in this hour about your two most recent novels, Oracle Night by Paul Oster, vertaald als Orakelnacht, and uh, What I Loved by Siri Hustvedt, vertaald als Wat me lief was. Um, first, but the both of you are going to read uh, a short passage from your novels. But before that, let me ask you just one small thing that struck me while reading uh, both of your books. Um, in the beginning of Oracle Night, Sidney Orr, the, one of the main characters, walks into the street after he has been very ill. And um, he realizes it feels like walking in somebody else's dream. And um, in the beginning of what I loved, uh, Professor Leo Hertzberg and his wife Erica look at a painting by Bill Wexler. And then Erica says, it feels like looking at somebody else's dream. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I can say is that I was working on my book for a long time. <laughs> Before Paul started writing Oracle Night. That's true. <laughs> do you read each other's books while working on them? Or do you discuss them very openly? We, we are each other's first reader, always. Mm. Mm. Um, but we do it in different ways. Uh, as I'm writing a novel, I usually read out loud to Siri every month or two when I have a 30 or 40 or 50 pages or 20 pages. Um, just to hear what it sounds like and to get Siri's comments, which are always very sharp. I don't think there's ever a time when I haven't taken her advice about something. Siri, on the other hand, uh, works in a different way. and um, A stupider way. Well, it's just that she, <laughs> she writes much faster than I do. and um, But she writes her novels in a series of drafts. And so when a draft is ready, I sit down and spend a few days with it, and I make notes and comments, and then we talk about it, sort of a big, big conversation. And then I do it over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it goes on like that for years until I finally write the last draft, usually from scratch, everything over again, the same story, but new words in a kind of last flood. And you approved of that last draft. The last draft. one was yeah. really good, yeah. <laughs> that you don't That's scribble it. anything anymore, or... No, he, ma he, he made me cut ten pages. Oh, really? And I loved those pages, and, and, I, and it was a whole history, the history of um, uh, a psychiatric history of psychopathy in, in ten pages, and I had worked so hard on it, and Paul said, you know, this is dragging the book down. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, but Paul, I work so hard on this one. <laughs> and then I said, okay, it's, I'm going to read the whole book from beginning to end, and if I think you're right, I'll cut them. And of course, he was right, and I cut them. Those pages will be published somewhere sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll need them at the, as, the ba as the base of a new book, mm. which happens in... No, but they mm. could be a little, you know, extract. Okay. If anyone wants it, it starts with <laughs> penal and, and ends with contemporary psy psychiatry. <laughs> okay. Um, Siri, let me ask you first to read a piece of your novel, please. I'm going to read two... Very tiny. Um, I have to say, this was at my urging. These yes. passages. Paul likes yes. it. Siri hasn't read about There's Matthew a, in public. This is the son of my narrator, who's a man. He's 70 years old when he's writing the story, and uh, this is uh, from fairly early in the book. When, uh, well, it's about his drawings. I don't think you know it. Bill is uh, Leo's best friend, and he's a painter. 
In a single body, Bill combined Matt's two great passions, baseball and art, and I watched as his affection for Bill gradually turned to hero worship. The last two Augusts we were in Vermont, Matt began to wait for Bill to finish working. He would sit patiently on the wooden steps outside the squat studio building, usually with a drawing on his lap. When he heard footsteps followed by the squeak of the screen door, Matt would jump up and wave the sheet of paper. I often saw this scene enacted from the kitchen, where I was engaged in my assigned task, chopping vegetables. Bill would exit the little building and pause outside the door. On warm days, he would wipe his forehead and cheeks with one of the paint rags he carried in his pockets as Matt ran up the remaining stairs toward him. Bill would take the drawing smile nod and often he would reach out and ruffle Matt's hair. One of those pictures was a gift to Bill, a drawing Matt had done in colored pencils of Jackie Robinson at the plate. He'd worked for days on it. When Bill returned to New York in September, he hung it up in his studio, where it remained for years. Although Matt was always sketching baseball diamonds and players, he never stopped drawing and painting New York City. Over time, these pictures became more and more complex. He painted the city in sunshine and under quiet gray skies. He painted it in high winds and in rain and in whirling snowstorms. He drew views of, of the city from above, from the side and from below. And he peopled its streets with sturdy businessmen and chic artists and skinny models and bums and the chattering lunatics we saw every day on the way to school. He drew the Brooklyn Bridge and the Statue of Liberty and the Chrysler Building and the Twin Towers. When he brought me these urban scenes, I would always take my time with them because I knew that only scrutiny would reveal their details. A couple entwined in the park, a child sobbing on a street corner beside its helpless mother, lost tourists, pickpockets, and three-card Monty cheats. The summer Matt turned nine, he began to include a character in almost all of his urban drawings, an older man with a beard. He was usually seen through the window of his tiny apartment, and like a hopper recluse, he was always alone. A gray cat sometimes prowled on the windowsill or curled up on the floor at his feet, but he never had any human company. In one drawing, I noticed that the man sat hunched in a chair with his head in his hands. This poor fellow keeps coming back, I said. That's Dave, Matt said. I named him Dave. Why Dave? I said. I don't know, but that's his name. He's a lonely guy, and I keep thinking that he should meet somebody. But when I get around to drawing him, he, he's always by himself. He looks unhappy, I said. I feel sorry for him. His only friend is Durango. He pointed at the cat. And you know cats, Dad. They don't really care. <laughs> well, I said, maybe he'll find a friend. You'd think I could just do it, because I made him up. But Uncle Bill says that it doesn't work that way, that you have to feel what's right. And sometimes, what's right in art is sad. I looked into my son's earnest face and then down at Dave. Matt had included veins in the old man's hands. A coffee cup and a plate lay near his feet. It was still a child's drawing. Matt's perspective was shaky, his anatomy a little askew, but the lines that etched the body of that solitary man affected me strongly, and I began to look for Dave whenever Matt handed me one of his seascapes. Oh God, here it is. Mm -hmm. This is another little bit about Matt. They've been to a baseball game. It was late when I walked into Matt's room that night with a glass of water to put on his night table. Erica had already left him. I leaned over and kissed his cheek, but he didn't kiss me back. He squinted at the ceiling for a couple of moments and then said, you know, Dad, I'm always thinking about how, people, how many people there are in the world. 
I was thinking about it between innings at the game, and I got this really funny feeling. You know how everybody is thinking thoughts at the same time, billions of thoughts. Yes, I said, a flood of thoughts that we can't hear. Yeah, and then I got this weird idea about how all those different people see what they see just a little different from everybody else. You mean that every person has a different way of seeing the world? No, Dad. I mean really and truly. I mean that because we were sitting where we were sitting tonight, we saw a game that was a little different from those guys with the beer next to us. It was the same game, but I could have noticed something those guys didn't. And then I thought, if I was sitting over there, I'd see something else. And not just the game. I mean, they saw me and I saw them, but I didn't see myself and they didn't see themselves. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> I know just what you mean. I've thought about it a lot, Matt. The place where I am is missing from my view. It's like that for everybody. We don't see ourselves in the picture, do we? It's a kind of hole. And when I put that together with people thinking there's zillions of thoughts, right now they're out there thinking and thinking, I get this floaty feeling. He paused. On the way home in the car when we were all quiet, I thought about how everybody's thoughts keep changing. The thoughts that people were having during the game turned into new thoughts when we were in the car. That was then, but this is now. But then, that now is gone and there is a new now. Right now, I'm saying right now, but it's over before I finish saying it. In a way, I said to him, that now you're talking about hardly exists. We feel it, but it's impossible to measure. The past is always eating up the present. I stroked his hair and paused. I think I've always loved paintings for that reason. Somebody makes a canvas in time, but after it's made, a painting stays in the present. Does that make sense to you? Yes, he said, definitely. I like things to last for a long, long time. Matthew looked up at me, then he took a breath. I've made up my mind, Dad, I'm going to be an artist. When I was little, I thought I would try for the major leagues. I'll always play ball, but that's not gonna be my job. No, I'm going to have a studio right here in the neighborhood and an apartment close by so I can visit you and Mom whenever I want. He closed his eyes. Sometimes I think I'll make great big paintings, and other times I think I'll make pretty small ones. I don't know which yet. You have time to decide, I said. Matt turned onto his stomach and gripped the covers. I leaned down and kissed his forehead. When I left Matthew's room that night, I stopped in the hallway and leaned against the wall for a couple of minutes. I was proud of my son. Like a rush of air in my lungs, the feeling grew. And then I wondered if my pride wasn't a form of reflected vanity. Matthew's thoughts echoed mine. And that night when I listened to him, I heard myself. And yet, as I stood there, I knew that I also admired a quality in Matthew that I didn't have. At 11, he was bolder and more certain than I had ever been. When I told Eric about our talk, she said, we're lucky, we're lucky to have him. He's the best boy on earth. And after that hyperbolic declaration, she rolled over and fell asleep. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Okay, I'll, I, I wasn't planning to read quite as much, but I thought I'd read the beginning of Oracle Night it has the sentence that you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> that I never thought about that. No, I didn't either. <laughs> I had been sick for a long time. When the day came for me to leave the hospital, I barely knew how to walk anymore. Could barely remember who I was supposed to be. Make an effort, the doctor said, and in three or four months you'll be back in the swing of things. I didn't believe him, but I followed his advice anyway. They had given me up for dead, and now that I had confounded their predictions and mysteriously failed to die, what choice did I have but to live as though a future life were waiting for me? <clears throat> I began with small outings, 
no more than a block or two from my apartment and then home again. I was only 34, but for all intents and purposes, the illness had turned me into an old man, one of those palsied, shuffling geezers who can't put one foot in front of the other without first looking down to see which foot is which. Even at the slow pace I could manage then, <clears throat> walking produced an odd, airy lightness in my head, a free-for-all of mixed-up signals and crossed mental wires. The world would bounce and swim before my eyes, undulating like reflections in a wavy mirror. And whenever I tried to look at just one thing, to isolate a single object from the onrush of whirling colors, a blue scarf wrapped around a woman's head, say, or the red taillight of a passing delivery truck, would immediately begin to break apart and dissolve, disappearing like a drop of dye in a glass of water. Everything shimmied and wobbled, kept darting off in different directions, and for the first several weeks I had trouble telling where my body stopped and the rest of the world began. I bumped into walls and trash bins, got tangled up in dog leashes and scraps of floating paper, stumbled on the smoothest sidewalks. I had lived in New York all my life, but I didn't understand the streets and crowds anymore. And every time I went out on one of my little excursions, I felt like a man who had lost his way in a foreign city. Summer came early that year. By the end of the first week of June, the weather had turned stagnant, oppressive, rank. Day after day of torpid, greenish skies, the air clogged with garbage fumes and exhaust, heat rising from every brick and concrete slab. Still, I pushed on, forcing myself down the stairs and out into the streets every morning. And as the jumble in my head began to clear and my strength slowly returned, I was able to extend my walks into some of the more far-flung crevices of the neighborhood. 10 minutes became 20 minutes. An hour became two hours. Two hours became three. Lungs gasping for air, my skin perpetually awash in sweat. I drifted along like a spectator in someone else's dream, watching the world as it chugged through its paces and marveling at how I had once been like the people around me always rushing, always on the way from here to there, always late, always scrambling to pack in nine more things before the sun went down. I wasn't equipped to play that game anymore. I was damaged goods now, a mass of malfunctioning parts and neurological conundrums, and all that frantic getting and spending left me cold. For comic relief, I took up smoking again and wild away the afternoons in air-conditioned coffee shops, ordering lemonades and grilled cheese sandwiches. As I listened in on the conversations, and as I listened in on conversations and worked my way through every article in three different newspapers, time passed. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that from all these um, very well-chosen passages, already we can see that these are two very different stories. Uh, one's about um, a writer who has been ill, who starts to write again and then finds that his story somehow starts to encircle his own life, uh, both reflecting it, premonitioning it, and repeating things from his own past. And the other story is about an art historian. Um, it's more than 25 years out of his life, I guess. And the people around him, his wife, his son, um, and the artist who is his best friend. But at the same time, and already um, the people who haven't read the books can maybe sense this from the things they've heard right now. There are some things that, um, that strike you when you read both books. Um, that they are both very um, much about the connection between life and art, and that they are both also about, well, where the self starts, if it starts at all, and where it ends. <laughs> so, um, what I wanted to do is talk about both these things, and let's talk, 
talk about um, the um, relation between life and art first for a bit. Let me precise this because it's a very bro uh, wide right. thing, of yes. course. <laughs> um, well, uh, you, um, Paul Ulster, in, uh, after this um, chapter passage you've read, um, Nick, um, of the uh, Sydney Orr, your main character, ends up in a small shop. He buys a notebook. He goes home and he starts to write. And uh, in a very precise and very fascinating way, you describe how um, his story evolves and uh, the beginning of it and how he picks things from his own life and recent experiences and um, puts them in, but also how some things seem to just float out of him unconsciously. Um, let, let's. Can I ask you about the relation between the way you wrote this and the way it happens to you as a writer? That's an interesting question. <coughs> um, Sidney, who narrates the book, is a novelist, um, but he really doesn't work in the way that I do at all. Hmm. I, he's not a stand-in for me. Um, at one point, for example, as he's composing the story, he hasn't written anything in almost a year, he's really been ill, and he's just testing out an idea. He's not really writing a story yet. But as he's thinking about the characters, he decides to give one of the female characters the, the body of his wife. So he imagines his wife in that, in that role. Um, I never do anything like that. Mm -hmm. well, my, my, my characters are completely imaginary. But sometimes I do. Sometimes Siri does. <laughs> But a minor, minor imaginary, um, their, their physical beings um, don't have a counterpoint, a, p in the, a counterpart in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, once, however, I did put Siri in a novel, City of Glass, but that was an homage to Siri, so she was really there. And she told me she had the odd experience. Um, my uh, protagonist, Quinn, shakes her hand and he remarks to himself on the thinness of the bones in her hand. And, and Siri said when she read the passage, it was like shaking hands with herself. <laughs> and uh, it's a very strange experience. It was, yeah. very weird. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so, no, I, Sydney writes in a different way from the way I do. Okay. But you, when you read this passage, did you recognize things? Uh, about the process of writing or no I just I, I know in my second novel um, I have a, a, a character who's um, also a painter as in the third novel but for that character who really doesn't resemble Paul internally at all I stole Paul's body for him mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just I, I remember I said to Paul is it okay if I just take your body it's not really you it's not but my <laughs> mind, right? I, I just want the external part of it so I had a brain transplant. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, I did do that. Hmm. And I think, you know, writers do sometimes take, you know, mixes or, or take a body and replace it with something else inside. Mm -hmm. um, Siri, in What I Loved, you describe uh, much more the process of making visual art. And um, there are some great passages in it about Bill Wexler. Um, coming up with uh, works of art mostly confined in a box um, yes. where all kinds of elements of his life turn up in some kind of contorted, distracted way. Um, he has a lot with uh, flow and repetition mm -hmm. apart from uh, just his biographical facts. Um, how did you um, manage to describe this process? What, what thoughts did you have while writing those passages? Well, I'd say a, a lot of the art just appeared to me. It was mm -hmm. kind of unconscious. I mean, that really was like dreaming these works of art. <laughs> At the same time, working on the novel, I realized that I spent all this time with Bill's work because it was essential to the story and that Bill knows more about the world, his family, and himself in his art than mm -hmm. he does, than he could ever say. And so there are elements in the art that actually prefigure what happens later. Not because the art is magic, but simply because he's 
feeling what he can't articulate in words. He feels what is right. He mm. feels what is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is an element that also turns up in Oracle Night, although it has a more, maybe a more sinister aspect to it, at least for Sydney Orr. Um, is it something you experience yourself, that you sometimes write something and then um, you feel it is maybe more true than you thought when you wrote it, or that it turns out to be true in another way? Or I think that, yes, it does happen. Rarely, but it does happen. Mm. Um, there's a story that was one of Sydney's friends tells him about a writer. Uh, Sydney's friend is much older than he is, and he's telling about someone he knew in Paris in the 1950s. Now, this is a true story. I didn't make it up. I didn't put the writer's name in the book, but uh, it really was a French writer named Louis René de Forêt, who was a very good prose writer. He wrote a book of stories, a novel, after the war, and he was considered one of the most promising young French writers of the period. And then he wrote a poem about a child who drowns. It was a little book. And not long after the book was published, Desforêts' own child drowned. And he was so horrified that he stopped writing for over 20 years, 20 or 30 years, he didn't write anything. And he felt that somehow the, the, the words that he had written had, had caused this accident to happen. Now, it's not true. It, I, it can't no. be true. No. But nevertheless, one can understand how shattered uh, a father would be if, if that had happened to, to, to someone uh, in that circumstance. It's just unbelievably powerful. So. In a way, I don't know if words can prefigure, but we sometimes feel they do in fiction. Certainly, words in the real world make things happen. Most of what happens in the world is because of words. Um, the inflammatory rhetoric of a revolutionary can get people to bring down a government. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Declaration of Independence in the United States, just a document, really started a whole country. Um, and then we have laws, too. I, I've just been thinking about this. Everything is written down. And yet, those words determine how we live. Um, those words say what's, what's a crime, what's not a crime, uh, how many dollars or euros you're supposed to pay in your taxes every year. And uh, we follow these words. Uh, in a, in a way, the entire world is governed by, by language and, and words, right. written, but, written words. But even in a, in a uh, more philosophical sense, language really dissects the world. You know, the word window is to some extent creating what we're seeing. I mean, this is just, a, it's a kind of philosophical truth. And you know, people who are blind and recover their sight, this is something I'm very interested in, um, say late in life and if you're born blind those people will never be able to see the way a seeing person can see and it's usually because of language without sight the way that uh, non-seeing people learn language has to do with smells and sounds and that is creating the identity mm -hmm. not vision and after a certain point, the human organism simply cannot reorient itself towards language and vision. Mm -hmm. So not only um, words define uh, who we are, but also what we are is defined by words. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it works both ways for both of you, in, in both of your opinions. Yeah. We yeah. agree, yeah. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> because uh, I wanted to go on to some other strange um, uh, connections between the two books. Um, well, the use of boxes. <laughs> there are, Bill makes his art in boxes and um, he puts little figures in the boxes. Yes. And um, well, somehow these figures tend to be locked in there. Um, whereas uh, that also happens um, to Nick in your novel. Uh, so Sidney Orr is writing about oh, yeah. a guy called Nick Bowen who is um, suddenly 
transforming his life. He goes to Kansas City and he ends up somehow, well, maybe you tell it. <laughs> well, it's such a complicated story. Mm -hmm. This is the story within the story. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yes, Bowen gets to Kansas City. Uh, he's suddenly out of money and um, he doesn't know anybody there except the taxi driver who uh, drove him to the hotel the night he arrived. And uh, um, this taxi driver is a 67-year-old black man, very corpulent. Ed Victory is what he calls himself. And um, so Nick goes to Ed Victory for help. And it turns out that um, Ed has this secret archive or museum under, underground. He's found some space. And um, inside, he, he's been collecting telephone books from all over the world for years. Um, it's rather complicated. Well, uh, you can get them into that room, Paul, and tell them what happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> through the whole story. <laughs> but for very complicated reasons, Nick winds up being locked up in a room. <laughs> and um, Sydney is writing the story, can't think of a way to get him out. And um, so, so he leaves him there. there. He leaves him there and he abandons the story. Mm -hmm. People have been very upset about this. <laughs> Um, frustrated, I suppose, mm -hmm. but I wanted them to feel frustrated because Sidney's frustrated. He's trying to figure things out and he can't. Mm -hmm. And if I had somehow allowed Sidney to figure out a solution to the problem, the whole book would have been different because it's about his blundering attempts to get his feet on the ground again and he's not quite there yet. When did you knew he, he was not going to get that? Um, I think I knew, um, hmm, that's a very good question. At first, I think I was planning to let him get him out. But then I realized as I was doing it that, it, that it's better to leave him in the, in the room. No, I, I remember. Yeah. I remember you had, you know, thoughts about, about exit strategies. Yes. And then, and then he just was left there. But I think, you know, first of all, the, the box or any a box or a room, these are very profound mm -hmm. images you know that recur in well in a lot of literature and uh, you know it's the old womb tomb mm -hmm. uh, uh, coffin uh, business and of course the boxes that Bill makes are well they're narrative boxes with an one open side so you look on. inside it's the exact opposite yes thing. it's it's mm -hmm. a way of, of in a having visual art that's narrative more mm -hmm. like a novel and you know with these little figures doing things um, there is however I mean there is a moment that I uh, I think you know no critics or reviewers really ever noticed it but in one of uh, Bill's boxes I took the ending from uh, City of Glass because I have I have the little character it's called the journey of O and uh, he, he vanishes in the last box. Mm -hmm. I thought everyone would notice, but... <laughs> <laughs> that was an homage that no one noticed. Mm -hmm. It's amazing <clears throat> how reviewers don't notice things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, not that it's an important point, but um, in, in my novel, the, Sydney's older writer friend is named Trous, John Trous, and uh, not one review in America noted that Trous is an anagram of Auster. Uh, other places, in Europe, for example, they, they picked Everybody it up noticed, right away. Yeah, yeah. But the Americans... They over-noticed. They, they, yeah, they over-noticed <laughs> and made too big a deal about it. Whereas in America, nobody even saw it. And um, so maybe it has... That's a comment on the quality of American reviewing mm. today. I don't know. You but paint Syria a pretty grim portrait of one art critic in your book. Yes. Who is a uh, pretty nasty, <laughs> yes, his nasty name person. Yes, is, is Hasseburg, uh -huh. which is, uh, you know, hate castle. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think I probably got out a little splenetic energy against, uh, you know, reviewers of the arts. I mean, it was, I think you it was rather did, fun. Yeah. fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the other hand, it's quite a serious portrait. He's a minor character, but I, I intentionally made him you know, not stupid, mm -hmm. um, someone who, you know, is able to write a sentence, someone who uh, should be respected on some level, and at the same time is operating from 
compli- for you know out of complicated psychological feelings of resentment something that i have to say is is not unique hmm. okay no, no. <laughs> Um, just to go back to um, some more, uh, some wider questions um, about the box thing. Just for last uh, last question about this. Um, for Bill, the boxes are something um, he he has a stage of his life, and then he makes a series of of boxes, and then he goes on. Whereas um, in your book, it's most of the time it's um, the premonition of a rupture, something abrupt, mm-hmm. which is, uh, I think, a big, big difference between the two books, that one book is about just clear cuts and ruptures and turning angles, whereas the other book is more about um, well, life as a floating thing where um, things don't really end and you cannot detect where they start, but they just come up. Um, I think this is a big difference. Yep. Well, the big difference is temporal. Mm. Series book spans 25 years, and it's mm-hmm. a, it's a it's a big saga. Whereas my book, I've always thought as a as a little chamber work, chamber piece, mm-hmm. and everything takes place in two weeks, and there are very few characters. Um, but it's also about dead ends. That book. And, yes, mm-hmm. and yeah. it's about dead ends, and it's um, so in in a way the books are couldn't be more dissimilar, really, mm. um, in scope and intention. Um, and in, in, in feeling. Um, I think maybe the one thing that links them is the um, intensity with which the protagonists love. I mean, Sydney loves Grace very deeply, and Leo loves all the people in his life very, very deeply. Mm-hmm. Mm. But other than that, nothing, nothing in common. I just couldn't disagree yeah. with you more. <laughs> 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 because um, uh, one of the things that's very similar as well is two children in both of the books. One child that somehow is lost and another child that somehow is also lost but then to himself that hardly seems to be a person, hardly seems to be um, open to humanity. Of course, also here there's a difference in scope because uh, um, in uh, Paul Oster's book, both children one child only gets up, doesn't get up until the end, and the other um, does not get born. Um, whereas in your book, yeah. both children, um, well, one dies at 11, and the other one um, grows up, well, partly. <laughs> yeah. So um, this uh, tells a lot about, um, well, the, the uh, development of, of a character, of, of people. Um, Siri, maybe you can tell us how you, um, well, developed Mark and Matthew. Well, you know, I think what your decisions I, yeah. around them well, were. Well, I think it's really, um, this book couldn't have uh, written without, um, this could, I couldn't have written this book when I was young. Mm-hmm. And I often I'll write about what scares me. This has always been a theme. Material that in some way I don't want to get very close to. And in the work I end up going places where I certainly wouldn't want to go in, (laughs) really. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think that, um, you know, as a mother, I, and I think all parents, the the thing we most fear is losing a child. I mean, that really is what um, and you know there are a number of ways to lose children, and uh, for I decided to explore that fear, and uh, and it was yeah it was quite frightening and terrible doing it, but at the same time, I think often that's what art is. Mm. And you? Well, in my book. Um it's very complex, um, and without having read the book, if most of yeah. you haven't read it, it's, it's, it's too difficult to explain, but there's some kind of Oedipal c- conflict going on between Trous's son and Grace, uh, who's yeah. the girl he's known since she was born. Grace is the daughter of Trous's best friend. And um, um, 
Charles and his wife were divorced uh, when the boy was very young. He had a very tormented uh, childhood and uh, grew up um, as, a, as a kind of rival with Grace. And uh, there's a very terrible scene that takes place at the end of the book. And um, see, Grace is pregnant. And uh, this pregnancy is one of the main subjects of the book. And um, Sidney isn't quite sure who the father is. And, um, and, and there's been some talk that maybe Grace will have an abortion. So the fact that she loses this unborn child in this terrible scene um, is, to me, just as Siri says, you know, you're going into places that are so dark and un unpleasant to be, so frightening. But I think as a writer, you have to go there. Otherwise, um, your work doesn't have any meaning um, unless you can face up to these um, dark spots. Hmm. And um, the book ends almost with, with her surviving but losing the baby. And um, one has no idea, uh, you know, if she'll ever be able to have children again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, about fear, um, also Leo, the character in your book, at the end of his life, says that he um, experiences some kind of, well, in Dutch, permanent ongerustheid, uh, permanent anxiety that uh, anything might happen in the near future. Um, at a certain point, I thought this is uh, maybe a very essential feeling for these characters. But then on the other hand, I thought maybe this is also a kind of New York neurosis. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, I very uh, purposely made Leo a, uh, a German Jew. Mm -hmm. He uh, leaves Berlin in 1935 with his parents. He's only five years old. I wanted a narrator who had a kind of exiled point of view. Even though he was in London for a while, and then like a lot of uh, German Jews, through a contact, they got themselves to New York. And uh, although his, uh, uh, nu the nuclear family escapes, his uh, grandmother, his um, aunt and uncle, and twin cousins are all murdered at Auschwitz. So Leo is both things. He is, this anxiety, in a way, prefigures the story. I wanted a person who knew that horror happens in the world. And Leo is a person like that. And oddly enough, I think that is part of his ability to survive a series of losses mm. and to remain a person who can attach himself to others. He remains a person who loves other people despite his experiences. Okay. And interestingly enough, um, Siri was working on her book f for six years, and I, I had been working on um, the Book of Illusions for over three, and we finished the two books on the, on the same week. It was no, weekend, the, the same, same weekend. weekend. <laughs> and I said to Paul, if you finish before me, <laughs> I'm going to commit suicide. <laughs> because I have worked on the book so long, he would write one, and then another would be coming along. <laughs> And I did finish literally hours before. You remember? It yes. was like hours. Maybe I the finished day on a Saturday and yeah. Paul finished on a Sunday. But just, just to lead up to the fact that yes. this was three weeks before September 11th, okay. the attack. So Leo has every reason to feel anxiety permanently. <laughs> and, uh, How did you celebrate? Oh, finishing? Mm -hmm. We were so exhausted. I actually just felt like lying down on the floor of my study and sobbing for about two weeks. That was my response to finishing. <laughs> um, I got drunk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you sound really happy. <laughs> um, for the last question, before we take some questions from the audience, um, I was just wondering, reading each other's books, commenting on each other's books, um, maybe you could just name one thing you learned from each other as colleagues. <laughs> oh, that's a good thing. Let's see. <laughs> well, I think, you know, when uh, Paul and I met each other uh, 23 years ago, and, uh, and 
I read his poems. That was the first, those were the first works I read. And uh, Paul hadn't published any prose at the time, only uh, poetry and essays and a pseudonymous detective novel. But when I read the poems, what most impressed me, and I think what I took inside me, was his ear. He has a great ear for the music of sentences. And uh, sometimes when we talked about uh, writing together, uh, he would look at my sense, he would say, Siri, I think those two vowel sounds, not so good together. And, um, and I definitely incorporated some of that sense of music, even though our styles are really very, very, very different. different. Yeah. I think um, the thing that I most admire, well, first of all, Siri's a great critic, so she's always been able to uh, take apart my work very incisively. And um, she's seen all the flaws in, in the stories that I've written. And somehow you're always able to put your finger on the spot where something's gone wrong. And um, that's why I trust you so much. But in terms of your writing, I think what it's taught me is the, um, the, the great attentiveness to um, physical detail and uh, uh, the way um, people move and respond say, d during a conversation. Uh, the, the small, intimate details of human interaction. I think there are very few people who, who write better than you do in that. And so that's something I've um, admired and, and tried to learn from. What a sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's take some questions for the audience now. Uh, as we haven't got so much time left, I would all I'd like to ask you to be very short and precise in your question. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A question to both. Um, every book has a beginning and an end. Uh, a first word, a first sentence, a last sentence, a last word. Can you say something about that, about the character or the importance of the beginning and the end? Um, <laughs> you want to go? You go first. <laughs> well, no, I just, I think the, 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 the best remark about that that I, I, I ever heard was uh, Paul and I were in Sweden years ago and we met Mickey Spillane. You know, no. the, I, thought, you know, I didn't even know Mickey he was Spillane? alive. Um, the Mike but, Hammer but book. He said this great thing. He said, nobody reads a book to get to the middle. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which is a, a wonderful comment that we quote to each other a lot, and it is connected, of course, to this beginning and end. I mean, I, I think a lot of people will open a book, and if the first sentence is really deadly, you don't want to go on. On the other hand, I've read quite a few books where the first pages are absolutely gorgeous, and somewhere around the middle, the whole thing starts to sag and collapse, and, and, you, and you lose interest. Um, so I think in some funny way, beginnings and endings are easier than middles. <laughs> You're probably right. I, I have to say that um, I think about the first sentence of each book for a long time. Yeah. And in a way, um, it's crucial. I mean, that's, that's the thing that gets the whole book started. And um, so I sometimes you know, work for for weeks on getting the, those first words in place. But what's so odd is, often, uh, I'll begin the book, it's happened a few times, and I know what the last sentence is already. Yeah. It's just, as Siri says, it's all, everything in the middle, you have to work out. <laughs> but you have a, but, but, but that sense of the trajectory and the, the poetry of it. And so the first and the last are, um, are there. Um, I didn't have it with this. Um, and I don't have it with the book I'm working on now, the last sentence. But um, other books like the Book of Illusions, I knew it would end. You know, I live with that hope. I mean, that was very important. Or Mr. Vertigo, like so. Yeah. That was there in my head as I, as I started writing the book. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I don't know if you're ever really satisfied, but there comes a point when 
there's nothing more you can do with it. Um, you've revised every sentence. You've told the story you tried to tell. Um, and, uh, and your wife has said that it's okay. <laughs> and then you give it to your publisher, and, and that's the end of it. And what happens with readers and critics, uh, it's so beyond my control that I, I don't think about it at all. It's just a matter of feeling that you've done everything you possibly can to make the book as good as you can, and then, and then you're done. It's, um, you could go on forever, I suppose, revising, but um, a point comes when I think if you overwork something, it gets, it gets worse rather than better. It loses its freshness. Siri said no, that. No, I said it. So, at the end, when you uh, make the baby die, uh, I read that episode as a, a solution of a problem and a possibility for the characters to make a new start. So, uh, for me, it was the only not dead end in the book. Well, there's some truth to what you say, but I think um, if I were Sydney and Grace, I would much have preferred for the baby not to have died, and, and, and they were ready. They were ready to have that baby together, yeah. and it is a very, very sad business. Um, what's 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 hopeful about the book? The end is that they are together, and um, and the fact that you're reading it. Sydney's writing it 20 years after the fact. So you assume that things have worked out pretty well between them because there's nothing to the contrary mentioned. So you assume that he and Grace are still together. Okay. One last question. Well, it leads me, um, married couple both writers in the same home. Um, how do you start your day? Your breakfast together is a good way. Yeah, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. I mean, we, we usually have breakfast, tea, coffee, New York Times, silence. Not too much talking. And Paul now uh, works in a studio, so he says, uh, see you later, sweetheart. And, and then I stay home, and we work somewhat. I work from about 8.30 to 2 uh, without stopping. And then I jump up and do other things in my life. And you work... You take lunch, that's the difference. I have lunch in, that, in my little studio where I work. And um, then I, I usually work in the afternoon till about four or five. And then I come home and, and then it's family life takes over. What, what are we doing? So it's Dinner just like and, a job, yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no shop talk, no. Only, but in at, the dinner, evening, at dinner yeah. and at evening there's a little shop talk. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a job, that seems to me a <laughs> <laughs> nice comment to conclude this afternoon with. Thank you very, very thank much you. for being here, and uh, thank you all. Thank you.